Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors for today. Of course, they need no introduction. You've seen the ads. You've heard me talk about them. I am talking about Blue Chew, of course, the OG chewable tablet for better sex. And I've got a special deal for my listeners. You can try Blue Chew for free if you go to bluechew.com, use code HOLLY, pay only $5 in shipping. Give it a try, guys. Okay, so my guest today is a premier solo performer who has mastered the art of mommy role play with the help of two particularly valuable assets, which I think you're going to know what they are when we cut to her camera. Let's welcome Karina Kova. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. I loved it. You're so welcome. You. Welcome to the show. Usually I start my interviews with talking about how you got into the industry, but I think we have to address the two, <laughs> two <laughs> elephants in the room. Um, you have particularly large breasts, um, which you are very well known for. What size do you wear? So now I'm a 32 double J cup, um, but you know, that's like constantly changing. I made the mistake of having a breast augmentation early on in my career. Mm -hmm. um, my fans helped fund that and that was very fun. But then, you know, three years down the road, I find out that I have gigantomastia, so it's a breast condition that just my breast tissue just keeps growing. And so when I first had the surgery done, I was per I thought they were just like this is peak of my breast goals. And right. I'm so happy. How, okay, so sorry. How big were they before you got the augmentation? Yeah, they were still they were a G cup, like mm -hmm. a full G cup. Naturally, I've always been really busty. Mm -hmm. Um but I just like developed boob greed when I got into the industry. I was mm. just like, I want more. I just love I like it. That. I like that word. The fans were encouraging <laughs> me. It was like, it was a euphoria of just like, I need more. And uh, yeah, so, and then when I did have the surgery, I put um, a small implant like above the muscle. So that's how I keep like the, the natural shape because that was really important to me. And mm -hmm. It was a double, it just went up one cup size, only one cup size. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was like, I think my boob grade's fulfilled. I feel like maybe I'll go like a little bit more when I need a lift. And then um, uh, I just noticed like nothing's fitting my breasts, like the bras, I'm just busting out of everything. Lingerie is, it used to fit, it doesn't fit anymore. So I just kept pushing my doctor for like answers. I would go through ultrasounds and like, um, like even a mammogram and like, um, thinking something was wrong, right? And uh, the diagnosis was pretty rare condition. And like the doctors in Canada don't really even uh, like give out this diagnosis. I could pursue it more so here with, with an extra scan, but um, I think the proof is just like with the breast growth because now they're double J. So that's wow. quite the difference. Okay. So I've never heard of this before. Can you Tell us like a little bit more specifically. Do they know what causes it? Is it just no, a genetic No, I mean like condition? it could have been triggered by like a couple different things and some hormonal stuff going on. It could have been triggered, but it also makes sense that this was, I was born with it because in high school, I mean, sorry, in, um, in elementary school and stuff, I developed quite early and mm -hmm. even my teachers noticed and they talked to my parents about that. Uh, having to be the first one in class to wear a bra it was always kind of like, the topic of my life, it seems like, mm -hmm. just like, you know, so it started out off as like an embarrassment. And then in high school, I would, I would duct tape them mm -hmm. underneath my clothes to try and like wow. make myself flat chested. Wow. And, uh, I got teased a lot, bullied a lot in high school for that. Um, you know, like snap judgment, like labeled as a slut when I was actually a virgin throughout the entire high school. Um, and then, yeah, so it makes sense. Like, I don't know when I started noticing it, but like, even as an adult, I would find myself as a dancer and I, they were always growing anyway. So mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not really sure. Wow. Yeah. And is it just, are they just going to continue? Yeah, unfortunately. So. I know. Now I have a gonna... problem to do. Yeah. I just, now I have to consider, which I mean, like, I'm not, Obviously, I'm not against surgery. I've had a lot of surgery done, but um, the reduction it it just kind of scares me more so than anything. But it's definitely in my future. What What does the reduction scare you? I don't know. It's just like it's a large surgery, mm -hmm. and the scarring is quite intense. Mm -hmm. 
um, it's riskier because you're taking away tissue than just mm-hmm. like a lift. Right. Or so like, like adding, taking like out all that tissue could cause complications. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm a little bit more timid when it comes to surgeries now. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, understandable. So do you, do they have, do you know at like what rate it grows? Like, do you, yeah, it's, so is it, is it jump and then it stops and then it's like, it's yeah. not consistent? Since I've been diagnosed, I've increased three cup sizes. Mm-hmm. So um, it's hard to say, like, I'm not measuring daily. I'm just kind of going by how things are fitting. And like right. recently, since I've been back from um, some time off in the in my career and everything, I've been losing weight, but mm-hmm. they're not losing, right? Mm-hmm. So usually if you would lose weight, your breasts would... That's like the first place yeah. thing that goes, And yeah. that's, you know, kind of another reason why I truly believe in the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. So is this a di- is this a diagnosis? Is it like controversial in any way? Are there some doctors so. who are like, this doesn't yeah, exist? I had to push. I had to, mm-hmm. you know, because it's not like it's painful. It's mm-hmm. not like I'm having symptoms, but it is affecting my life in the way that like it's I feel kind of always I chose to have the breast surgery, but I didn't know that it was going to go to this extreme. Yeah. So it's like even like a normal dress now is it doesn't look so normal every day. So it affects right. how I'm presenting myself. Like it just affects my self-esteem mm-hmm. in a way. So I know that there's going to be some people who are going to watch this and say like, oh, what a great problem to have. You know, like, think, <laughs> Men, like yeah. yeah. What, what would your response to them be? Like how, what are like the the actual specific things that make it so difficult to have large breasts? I had a little mental breakdown Mm -hmm. like last, I think it was two weeks ago with my friend Mm -hmm. because I had just gotten back from a trip, a family vacation where I took my mom to Mexico and it really hit me. It's like, I can't dress these down. Yeah, I'm always like the second I got off the airplane, this girl comes up, can I touch your boobs? How do you get boobs like that? And they do pass off as real. Mm -hmm. And like, I could just say they're real, but most people just, you know, oh, you did this to yourself. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to stare. I'm going to look. I'm going to yell. You asked for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like when I'm trying to tone that down or be in a family situation where I don't want the attention, I'm trying to enjoy things. It's like, it's hard because guys and girls are yelling and across the pool from and and it's like you're going to a warm place right so you're not going to wear any clothes you're going to a pool so you're going to wear a bikini or like a one piece and yeah yeah it's not like you're going to wear a turtleneck everywhere you go right i have a lot of friends who you know have large breasts and they say that like it causes a lot of back pain Mm. do you deal with that um i've been lucky so far I mean, I can't lie. Of course, I'm always on my roller stretching my back. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like I'm having that issue yet. Mm. But I mean, that's like another thing that's down the road that's going to be, yeah, like I do some Pilates and some strength training and stuff like that to try and, but my posture is starting to show it. Mm-hmm. But I don't have back pain. Sounds like you've been actively working to not have it. Yeah, I feel like um, it wasn't like I'd had been carrying this chest around my whole life. So Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes a difference. But what does bother me is like even this, I think there's like an indent. So Mm -hmm. my shoulders get sore more than anything. Right. Even just like little straps. Yeah, that makes sense. And it makes it hard to find clothes that fit. You can't wear a strapless like ever. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I, I, I honestly, like, I mm. I would not want to be in your position, so I, I feel for you. I know, like, yeah. a lot of people think, like, oh, the biggest boobs, the best, but I think you've really outlined how it can affect you, like, in a negative way. Yeah, because it's just, sometimes I explain it to my friend as it's just, like, I want to take them off and hang them up, you yeah. know, and, like, just, because yeah. it doesn't matter if I'm wearing a sweatshirt or whatever, it's, it's they're there. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. So, yeah. And it would be another thing if you had actually gotten a breast enlargement to that size, mm-hmm. like that was your goal, right? Mm-hmm. Then you'd be... Sometimes I get a little manic and I'm like, I tease my fans. I'm like, should I go bigger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to have that moment online. But I mean, when I when I actually am being honest, mm-hmm. truth telling, 
no, I will not increase the size. If anything, it's just going to be starting to take care of the problem, such as what gravity does and like how big they are. Right, yeah. right. Um, but I would assume that they're probably like a huge money maker for you, right? Oh, like yeah. that's your focus with your fans. It so it's like, yeah, yeah, it's that weird double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I and mean, that's big. why people have a hard time having sympathy for me mm -hmm. and like even having a, like a heart to heart and crying in front of my friend. It sounds dramatic, but it mm -hmm. was a mental breakdown. Um, it's just like she's just like I could see it in her face like she loves me and everything. But it's like you got to think of it as a blessing. But then, you know, yeah. I am allowed to feel a little yeah. bit cursed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before you were in porn, did having big boobs like affect your dating life? I had such a bad experience growing up with big boobs. Mm -hmm. The embarrassment from like being pulled aside and like my mom telling me I have to be the one to wear a bra in class. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, that's just like it starts it off as this, it sets the tone mm -hmm. of like it's shameful or like hide them and everything like that. And then in high school, it was very the boy's attention, it was just too much. Mm -hmm. It was just like, she has those, she must be a slut, she must put out, she must, you know. So mm -hmm. it was like a lot of unwanted attention. I, yeah. yeah. You were not yeah. able to like just be yourself and be mm -hmm. and and present yourself just as a as a person. It was always like the boobs and yeah. then the face. Yeah. Right? I like had, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's it's almost like it's just like this is my lead. Mm -hmm. always when yeah. I don't want it to be sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Another bad experience, like I've never spoken about it before. It's just like there was this hockey player and he was going to go be drafted or be successful or whatever. And all my, these girls that wanted to uh, make me feel pretty shameful about myself, like they set up this camera to record me changing because he invited me over for a hot tub. And yeah, they recorded me changing. And like a couple people saw it before it got deleted. And that was just like, that made me feel so terrible wow. after that. So after that, I was just like, no dating, hide my boobs, like no attention. And it's like, after I got out of high school, things just switched for me. Like going into serving started mm -hmm. to make money and like started to be financial gains and like maybe like attention that benefited me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I made like an entire switch and then went into exotic dancing after mm -hmm. after serving. Yeah. Because, you know, serving is pretty- As a waitress. Yeah, as yeah. a waitress. It's it's actually like a lot more to deal with than even dancing Yeah, with guys. Yeah, no, um, diners can be quite- rude Back in, and disrespectful. yeah. I think it's gotten better maybe, but mm -hmm. like back in my time- it was free for all, just grabbing, touching. And in the strip clubs I worked in, you weren't allowed to do that. So there was more rules in the strip club than there was That's as a crazy. server. So you yeah. got groped yeah. more as a waitress with than you did. With managers, with staff, with wow. uh, customers. Yeah. And like slipping you like offers, like be a sugar baby, you know, this kind of money. Mm -hmm. Weekly set you up an apartment more so than when I was a dancer, you know what I mean? So it was yeah, crazy environment. That is crazy. Yeah. Wow. So it was, once I got into dancing, I felt safer. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely want to hear about your journey into dancing and then into the adult industry, but we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we will be right back. Hey there, listeners. Have you ever felt like you could be missing out on the best sex of your life? It's time to change that with Blue Chew. They say that first impressions are important, but what about lasting impressions? With Blue Chew, you can leave a mark that won't be forgotten. Blue Chew brings you the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. It's convenient, discreet, and gets delivered right to your door. We all know that confidence is key, especially in the bedroom, and there's nothing sexier than feeling confident where it counts. Blue Chew can help you achieve that confidence, ensuring you're always ready to perform at your best. So this is how it works. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once approved, you'll receive your chewables within days. These chewables start working fast, so you will always be ready when the moment is right. Blue Chew wants the entire country rock hard. That's what they told me. 
That's the mission. They will not stop until every man is bricked up like a brick house, till every tent is pitched, till every rod is raised. Discover your options at bluechew.com. And they've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code Holly at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code Holly to receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And thank you so much, Blue Chew, for sponsoring the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Okay, so Karina, so you started waitressing. Mm -hmm. Your boobs, you suddenly realized that you could monetize them. Yeah, that was the first time I started dressing for like once I got out of high school and went into serving. And, like, I was pretty modest at first, and then I saw all the other girls wearing low-cut tops and mm-hmm. making all this money, and I did that, too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, then I started to be like, I'm in control of this attention kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And then how did that move into feature dancing? Actually, the girls from the club that I wanted to, like, work at, I, I didn't know about it before, but they came in and spent a bunch of money and was like, oh, I think you could really do really do well in this industry come by our club it was kind of like that moment that mm-hmm. it felt like a tv moment or something and i went into there and to see them cuz you know i was curious and it was insane they're like doing these circus style performances their costumes are like impeccable and beautiful and showgirl and like it wowed me i was so like so wasn't that kind of dingy strip club that maybe you were imagining or People like you yeah. know, have in the back of their heads of like these sad looking girls who are like staring off into space and like wearing neon mesh. It was mm-hmm. seemed to be a little bit more than that. Well, I wasn't clueless. Like I'd been to strip clubs with my mm-hmm. friends before, but yeah, this one was like something I'd never seen before mm. and how they were just uh, making like a whole show of it. Um, they They were nice girls and like they told me all the money they made and like they were... Yeah, that was a lifestyle I was definitely interested in. It's interesting that you got pulled into the club from other girls, from other dancers, because I almost never hear that. Really? It's usually like the like a girl goes out and specifically seeks out like a strip club because they need to make money or something mm-hmm. they were interested in doing or a guy pulls them in. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you had like the female dancers from that club yeah. invite you in. What was the environment like in general, like behind the scenes um, with the other dancers, managers? Well, like before I could get into that elite club, Mm -hmm. I had to like go be on the circuit and like Mm -hmm. really learn the ropes and everything like that. So I was a traveling dancer for quite a while. Okay. So it was kind of like boot camp to like work up to like my goal where I Ah, wanted to be. Okay. Yeah. So I couldn't just jump in there. Mm -hmm. I could have as a VIP dancer, but not a stage dancer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So yeah. So I did that. And um, yeah, the, the, Backend experience of dancing is very interesting. It's never dull. Always drama. Uh, You learn to really keep to yourself or things get messy. Yeah, I've heard some crazy stories. Remember London River told Mm -hmm. me that once like a stripper peed in her purse. Is that a shared experience? Oh my God, did that happen to you too? They peed in my suitcase of of (laughs) stage costumes. Who? who, I need to know. I've... This is crazy. <laughs> How could someone have this experience? I don't know. Maybe there's like tons of strippers I out there. I would never who instinctively all... pee in someone's, like, that's just like animalistic to me. I'm just like, I didn't know that would be a shared experience. Yes. <gasps> yes. She I talked feel, about it on the podcast. I don't podcast. feel alone. You don't feel, okay, good. Wow. I'm so glad that you feel, you feel seen. <laughs> Girls, if you're a stripper, don't you dare pee on someone's stuff. That's, <laughs> that's crazy. So wait, tell me about your experience. Oh my gosh. Okay. So as a traveling dancer or whatever, you have to share a change room. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's usually the case, but um, you're never really working with the same people because you're kind of just like jumping around. Um, but you're you're fighting for the same customers basically. Mm-hmm. So it's like um, if there's, I mean, we, we call it a whale or whatever, right? Like oh, I know a high spender, is, yes. you know, it's like a good man. Um, yeah. So anyways, it, it happened over, um, him kind of having affection for me and mm-hmm. starting to bring me gifts and starting to follow me around, uh, 
places in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, yeah, so it was a little bit of a jealousy thing, right? Because I wasn't trying to step on toes. I wasn't intentionally trying to do that. But I mean, if you got to let him go, if he's going to, it's got to be a civil fight. You can't pee on someone. You can't mark your territory. (laughs) Anyways, so I'm on stage and I come back and it's just smells so bad. All my stuff is damp and it's a distinct smell. It's not like you're preparing for squirting where you're slamming a bunch of water. Yeah. She was not she hydrated. Had like a lot of coffee, yeah, maybe some wine. So I had to go Vitamins. home. I couldn't finish my night because I had nothing to wear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was filth. It was disgusting. Oh my god. Yeah. Do you have any other crazy stripper stories? Um, I mean, like just petty little things like I had these beautiful mucklucks that a customer bring me to the club. What are those? Um, so like in Canada, I don't know. Well, they're, they're in here too. But in cold weather, they're like um, Native American boot. That's like, okay. it will last forever. It's done beautifully, mm-hmm. handmade. Um, I cherish them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyways, it was a nice gift. And I come back up and I go to put them on to leave for the night. And there's raspberries in them. Destroyed them. Like raspberries. Oh my God. Yeah. So just sabotage stuff, just very petty. Yeah. And I don't have an ounce of that in my body. Like anyone who's known me my entire life, like I don't retaliate. I don't have a jealous um, bone in my body towards like a sexual partner, a boyfriend, or anything like that. Like, Mm -hmm. and so to me, it's just such an unfair fight because I won't fight back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, even if you do fight back, it's kind of like, where is that going to get you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. in, in a battle. Yeah, and then just like writing stuff on the wall, like Karina gives a clap around the club and stuff like that. Just very... Wow, it sounds like high school. Yes, yeah, so it was high school all over again. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So how did you end up um, shooting adult content? Taking that step into adult work. Mm-hmm. It happened at a time in my life where it was like kind of a flight or a fight or flight kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like someone was sick in my family. I had to be at home. I couldn't be at the bar anymore. I had to look after them. But I had dabbled in camming before. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it was like completely out of the realm for me. But to start making movies like masturbation movies mm-hmm. um, with toys and stuff, it was a step for me. And it was like a risk for sure. And I wasn't sure if I was ready for it. And it kind of just threw myself into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you only do solo work, right? Is that something that you had decided from the start mm-hmm. you would only do? Have you ever considered working with other people? Or have you always been very adamant about remaining a solo performer? Yeah. That's just like, um, even dancing, like I probably waited a little longer to get into dancing too. Because... I le- had some learning curves in the in dancing world mm-hmm. where it's like your boundaries are really tested. Mm-hmm. And you if you if you don't set those boundaries for yourself, then you find yourself feeling terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one thing I did do before I started posting online was like, what are my boundaries? What are my limits? And yeah, I stuck to that. How old were you when you started shooting um online content? Um, it's hard to say, like, honestly, my memory is so bad, but like time, like, it's just like not a strong point in my life. Um, just average. Yeah. Average. Like I've been doing it for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I dabbled in camming back when I was dancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I didn't like camming. Right. So yeah. would you say like mid 20s? Yeah. Like- yeah. Like more like, yeah. Mid. Yeah. Late. To late. I, I ask only just because you talked about boundaries mm-hmm. and, you know, really waiting. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that comes up on the show a lot is, you know, the question of whether or not 18 year olds mm-hmm. are wise enough yeah. to make these decisions to get into this, right? Yeah. If they really like think about the ramifications and mm-hmm. all of that. And, you know, there's arguments that go both ways. Yeah. Some people say 18 is too young. Other people say, you know, there's, and I have met you know, people of both sides where they came in at 18, Mm -hmm. they -hmm. knew what they wanted, they were comfortable setting boundaries Mm -hmm. and it got them out of like a bad situation or got Mm -hmm. them financially independent, um, really improved their life. They were able to take care of their family, like that kind of thing. So, and then, you know, of course there's the other side where like they didn't make, but I also know, you know, 
28 year olds who yeah. have come in, 30 year olds oh, who have come in sure. and make bad it's, decisions. So yeah. It's like, it, but if you do put age into a factor, yeah. Or if there was just like a little bit more to our industry of like mm-hmm. before you get into it, there has to be a, like a little bit of a training period or something like that or mm-hmm. a, something to really understand that the, it's forever, the internet's forever, and these decisions will really affect your life forever. So yeah, I, I don't feel like there's enough. I feel like the age would be okay if we had more awareness of everything else. Because like even when I dabbled in stuff, I didn't understand really the ramifications the yeah. internet would bring to me and like, you know, the privacy issues and all everything that comes with it and piracy and you can't control who's going to see your stuff and yeah. possibly doing something you're uncomfortable with and then having that be a, a note in your life where it's for people to watch. So yeah. it's quite serious. I think it's hard though too, because the adult industry isn't like one, there's not one yeah. entry point, right? right. So there's no way to like so gatekeep that. And there's so many different ways you can get in. And, you know, if you do your research, you can find all of this information yeah. on what it will do um, for your life. But a lot of people aren't necessarily interested in doing yeah. that research. It's a impulsive thought. Maybe it's a desperate thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we've all, you know, made yeah. last minute decisions, last ditch effort decisions that mm-hmm. we wish I hadn't made. I've, mm-hmm. I've certainly been there myself. Mm-hmm. And then also, you know, there's a lack of literacy online just in general. You know, like obviously it, mainstream is always going to portray the porn industry as one specific thing. So it, it's hard to find a balanced view of here are the positives, mm-hmm. here are the negatives, look at it both is. of these and weigh it. I mean, I remember, so there was a place, so before, um, you know, our current testing protocols, we, I, I know you don't have to test because you do solo performances, but, um, you know, there's various uh, testing clinics and we use a system called PASS mm-hmm. in general where everybody's tests get uploaded to. So, but before all of that, there was AIM, which was the Adult Industry um, Medical, AIM Adult Industry, what did the M stand for? Anyways, Mm -hmm. they were the testing center. It was the first testing center that came up in the adult industry, and it was run by Sharon Mitchell. Yeah. And um, I think I watched a documentary. Yeah. And it was a place where, and she had like a educational Mm -hmm. video for people. And that's And like a pamphlet, and she would give it to them when they would come get tested. But (laughs) most of them wouldn't read it. That's right. It's like throw it it. in the bag and let's get the bag. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? Like you can only do Mm -hmm. so much. So yeah. But yeah, whenever I talk to people who came in later and really like considered it, I find that they have reported a better experience, at least in the mm-hmm. beginning. Yeah. Um, but you seem to hint that you had some bad like ramifications to your choice. Do you have any like more specifics on that? With uh, like just, entering it? Like, yeah, just getting into the adult industry. Like yeah. how has it affected your life in a yeah. in a negative way? And how has it affected your life in a positive way? Yeah, there's, I mean, like, luckily I have a family, a very supportive family. That's Literally, key. they all know what I do. Like, yeah. it's not like I've sat them down and each had a conversation. But yeah, they know who I am as a person and they're comfortable with it that, you know, as long as I'm safe, happy, healthy, and not hurting anyone or myself, you know what right. I mean? But like, yes. So for me, like, stalking is a problem, harassment, piracy, just constant like pressure of like, when are you gonna do boy girl? Like come. you're so boring. Like get over yourself. I like come on, take that dick. Imagine. Like come on. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna do it someday. I know you are. And it's the taunting. It's like, uh, let me tell you <laughs> right now. You've heard it here. I'm not switching over. I'm staying solo. Happy. Yeah. Happy doing what I'm doing. Don't you want to see me happy? <laughs> girl, you have no idea how yeah. much I relate to that. Yeah, it's um, and it'll be the same people that'll ask you the same question. Yeah, it's like, and it's the ones that aren't my fans. Yeah, they're more so just like they're not rooting for me. They're not supporting me. They're not, they're not even supporting in a nice way. Like, not talking financially, but like even just being a good fan. Like, if you like watching me that much, just understand. Yeah, just don't you know ask for it. And then it's just like, also, there's so many girls in the industry find someone similar that does do what you want to see yeah stop trying to get it from me yeah Yeah. um so 
Do you do custom requests? Yes, I'm 100% custom requests. Okay, so tell me a little bit about those. Like, what's like the most unusual custom requests? I do so much crazy stuff. I love customs. I love all the crazy requests. I mean, obviously, I say no to customs all the time because it's against terms of service, Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do those things. But um, I'm a happy uh, role player. Do you have any examples of anti terms of service customs? Oh, yeah. Just, I mean, Maybe like, you want me to say it all? I want you to say it. Okay. The nasty, like just like stuff that's just, uh, dark web stuff, like mm-hmm. you know, um, potty stuff. And I knew you were going to say reality. And, and I like, brought I brought up the potty stuff. <laughs> I wanted you to say the potty stuff because I actually literally just had Lotus yeah. uh, bomb on, and we had a <laughs> whole conversation about shitting. Yeah. And um, you know, we've both received those requests. And we were just like... It's just sex work is so wild. Like you can think of the craziest thing that you would never in your life ask out loud or say, and and people have asked for it straight up, straight up serious face. It's so interesting, like the human psyche and mm -hmm, sexuality mm -hmm. specifically, and these little niches that people find. Mm -hmm. Like I remember one of the most interesting ones that I had heard of, and just because it's such... It's not even like crazy where it's like, oh, like, you know, like, oh my God, I would never do that. Or that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. It was just this one guy, I think it was Candlebox who told me she had a fan. He wanted her to sit on a black duffel bag Mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. Right. And it's always so specific. It's so cool. Like, I like those kind of things. Yeah. I'm like... Okay, I mean, let's get in your brain. Let's get that fulfilled. I'll sit on yeah. that black duffel bag <laughs> and I'll do it for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you That's ever awesome. do you ever ask them like why or do they ever explain to you why um, they have a specific request? I'm curious sometimes. I mm-hmm. also like to understand what I'm doing, what I'm performing. I like to have an understand understanding for it because like not all all requests, like they could be requesting the same thing, but they're asking for it in a different way. Yeah. Like I found with experience, sometimes I'm like, I really nailed that custom. Mm -hmm. And then like, maybe he was like, oh, I thought you would do it in a more loving way, not such a dominating way. Mm. Right. So it's just like little things. I like to get the whole lowdown. Mm -hmm. Like customers are known to send me sometimes like three pages of a script. Wow. And detail. I love to pay attention to detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you really want to fulfill, cause those, those customer requests are Filling a very specific fantasy, yes. right? Because otherwise they would be able to find it just in generic right. porn. But if they need to ask for it as a custom, mm-hmm. it means there's there's some it's not something they can just find out there. Yeah. I love to like make the tone right. I love to make the outfit right. I like to make even like the the scenery, mm-hmm. you know, like I love to take the time for that stuff. Mm-hmm. Really enjoy it. That's great. Yeah. Do you have any fans that like do consistent custom requests. They like yeah. order a lot. I have fans that have been with me since day one, have helped me upgrade camera systems, have like literally like funded, and they're still getting these crazy customs and we're just getting crazier and crazier. Yeah. Yeah. So they've been ride or die with me through, gosh, like ups and downs, like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to have that kind of connection with your fans. Yeah. Huh? I call them my core fans. I love you guys so much. Oh, <laughs> They're like that. biting at the bullet for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so we, here I am. I'm here to deliver. Yeah. <laughs> you asked for a custom interview and here you go. <laughs> <laughs> you invested more than 30 grand into your home filming setup. Mm-hmm. What like does that entail? Yeah, that's just like the, the filming equipment. I've mm-hmm. um, When I had my hard times, What helped me through them was to keep investing in my house and my studio. So like now I have a secondary built studio, so I haven't really talked about that yet. But um, that's like on the finest final touches. Mm -hmm. I'm super proud of it. But yeah, I'm constantly just, I'm geeking out. I'm wanting different camera stuff. I like like it. It's It's my kink. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So like I have my sights set on upgrading to my final same as like a car you know when you have just like your dream car i have my dream camera but you know it's once you get that camera they're gonna come out with something better sure well that'll keep me going in life (laughs) but i feel like uh, i'll finish my last five years with that camera in my career i hope yeah i have to say i actually went on chatterbait the other day with my my partner i'm working on a platform and we were just 
we were kind of looking at some UI stuff. And there was this one girl, we just randomly landed on it. And her the quality of her camera was so, so fucking good. Had the blurred background, bokeh Yes. Yeah. Yes. I That's what that I said. I'm like, look at that. Check out that bokeh in the background. He's like, what the fuck are you talking yeah. about? He's like looking at her tits. I'm like looking at like, the, <laughs> the blur in the background. I was like, oh my God. like aesthetically. God. It was, be- both of us were like, wait, yeah. is this what? Is she framed in the third? So it's oh like my- a little bit of background and it's like more appealing to the eye. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. And so we... We were like, wait, is this? And then we jumped around and looked at some other cameras because we're like, is this just like the quality of mm-hmm. Chatterbait now? But no, it was this girl's camera. Shut up. Nice. It was like insane. And then she was making a lot of money. She was also super hot. Now, you also have a $40,000 collection of sex toys. Mm-hmm. Is that right? So yeah. tell me how, like, how does that work? And what is the most mm-hmm. expensive toy in your collection? Well, now I have my doll. Mm-hmm. Oh, your sex doll. Yeah. Oh, those are so expensive. Yeah. Well, I mean, I that was like a partnership with the brand. So, I mean, I didn't work, you know. Right. But, but I have her. In but in terms of now. value. Yes. Yeah. The second one that comes close is like that real cock that they engineered a cum tube through it. So, I mean, it was two grand for the wow. dildo. Wow. So, because I do solo work, like I really take pride in trying to give them, trying to give you guys the most realistic experience so mm-hmm. i'll go to any length to get like a real looking cock wow and it and it shoots come out of it uh-huh. okay so how does that work is there like a timer on yeah, it no um like i uh have a trusted crew of people i work with for my camera people and stuff like that and so they have that lucky job of shooting off the cum so is it remote control no it's or like a it- syringe so it, like it has a cum tube that feeds through the okay. dildo And so the syringe pushes it out. I mean, I would like to engineer something with like a little bit more, like, Mm. give me that blast off. Yeah. Like, so maybe enough. No. Fake cum. Not giving enough. Like, is it just like a little dribble? Yeah. So I have to do the work of like getting underneath it and like slapping it all over my, you know, glazing myself. (laughs) (laughs) So ideally, like, a company would kind of start researching into like more realistic fake cum lubes that would allow the syringe to shoot it off mm. give me that money shot mm-hmm. yeah sounds like this is like something that you need to engineer right. like I would partner to do something with someone like that. yeah and like really make the perfect come shooting dildo i'm i'm willing to go down that road <laughs> it'd be <laughs> I, a good back hobby and um, i feel like you will go to any lengths i to, will to get that to get that money shot yeah like i'm actually just like i don't have sex anymore you know what i mean i haven't had sex in like Five years, literally. Wow. So I'm just addicted to virtual sex and I'm addicted to sex toys. Wow. Yeah. So I'm assuming you haven't really dated then in like no. five years? I just get so much, honestly, like, I don't know, maybe maybe it's personality flaw, but like, I really find fulfillment in like my online connections. Mm. I'm honest, like. Yeah. So, I mean, would if you met the right guy, would you like to date or do you actually feel satisfied just being single and like I'm straight online. right mm-hmm. like I like you know men mm-hmm. um maybe if it'd be cool if I met like a guy that needed a prosthetic penis then I could have my fix of like the toys and mm-hmm. with the sex life kind of thing I don't know like a guy maybe with a micro penis Oh no! Oh, you don't want that? <laughs> no, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, because like then they can like put like a fake prosthetic penis on top. I'm of not it. against small penis. Like I love mm. to do a small penis humiliation, mm. but I also love to do small penis encouragement. Okay, I'm not a yes, yeah, or nay, but like f- if I was to get down to business with like getting back into my sex life, I'm not gonna enjoy a ride with a micro cock. Right. Okay, so you said small penis encouragement. I don't I don't know if I've ever heard that before. I've heard lots of small penis humiliation. Yeah, I've so seen it's just it. more so like you're acknowledging that they do have a small penis, but you're being like loving and encouraging about it. Like, yeah, you go, little guy. Like, you can still do it. Like, I'll just give you a chance. Oh I'm not going to feel it penetrate me, but I'll still like, it's cute, you know? Oh my God, it's so like it's the little engine that could. Yeah. <laughs> you got to laugh. But. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, little guy. You yeah, can do it. can do it. And you can, you know, like, wow. enjoy these curves and I'm not going to penetrate much through it. But like, 
Let's it's, get that. It's almost like the humiliation, but like in a different tone, yeah, don't you that's think? that's what I mean. So it's still like... It's so interesting. It's, they still enjoy the fact that I, like, I'm not interested in their mm-hmm. small penis, mm-hmm. but they're not wanting to be humiliated about it. Mm-hmm. Like it's encouraged in it. Interesting. I've never heard a script go that way, but that makes sense. Now you really do like the the mommy kind Love of it. encouragement. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about that niche. Yeah, I do like like I said like tone for mm-hmm. that kind of role play is so important. Mm-hmm. Like the taboo role play really taught me mm-hmm. basically like a lot about sex work. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, so it's just like I I'm dom mummy a lot, I'm submissive mummy a lot, I'm like disciplinary mummy a lot and uh yeah, I just, I love it. My mummy boys fund most of my stuff. <laughs> and I do love the taboo role play. Do you find that they're often younger than you? Yes. Or do they vary in age? Actually, I mean, like, I can, I honestly, I I don't know if I can really answer that because I have only, only one person in my core group is that, mm-hmm. that I've like broken it down and been like, know her, his age and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's like they're older than me or younger than me. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I should take a tally or a vote or a poll. You should. Do yeah. a poll. They're interested. Yeah, do a poll and let me know. I'll do it for the plot. <laughs> Is there one particular um, tone that you prefer to do? Like, do you prefer the nurturing or the dom or? Mm-hmm. If I had like the four scripts in front of me and I could choose a tone for the day, I'd probably just go with the nurturing. It mm-hmm. just probably comes more naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, but Enjoyment wise, I enjoy the Dom mm-hmm. a lot more. Like strict Dom. It's it's a lot more fun. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if I want to have just like a really smooth shoot day where I'm not really challenging myself, I would fall into the role of caretaking. Yeah. Got it. Do you do dick ratings? Yeah, I love them. I do like so many a week. They're they're oh, yeah. they're big business. Yeah. Um, tell me about like how you do your dick ratings. All right. I still film on like my crazy camera for dick ratings mm-hmm. and people are like, yes, I could just go like this with my phone and mm-hmm. give the people what they want, which is like a quick return on a dick rate, but I just can't do it. Yeah. Oh, I just can't do it. So I have the whole setup for the dick rates, mm-hmm. like, you know, and, um, and yeah, I just rate the crap out of their cock. Do you give them, so it's like a, a scale of one to 10, I assume? Yeah. At the end, I let them know where they fall on my range of mm-hmm. appealing, like how I find it, it like overall appeal to mm-hmm. me. And like a bunch of different things goes into that. Like, it's like, you could have this huge monster dick, but I mean, like everything falls into my rating, mm-hmm. like appeal wise. What are like some of the specific things that you look at? I look at like overall just like how proportionate it is. I love like the tip of a cock is my favorite part. Really? So like the definition on the tip is very important. doesn't mean you have to be like circumcised. So like Mm -hmm. pull that skin back. Let me see. Like the tip of the cock is the most important thing to me. There's like bonus points. If I like see full balls, I like that. Mm -hmm. Or if I see like dripping Mm pre-cum. And also if I know that dick pic was taken just for me. Mm. that's a bonus and um yeah there's ways to get higher on the scale how honest are you do you find it depends because honestly like this is my career Mm -hmm. and if you're going to request that i'm honest i am 100 percent honest Mm -hmm. but if you are a small penis simulation guy or uh, a size queen lover you know what i mean i gotta take those things into consideration because I think of dick rates as a custom video. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's what they want to see. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not going to be honest because that's what they've requested. Yeah. But most guys are wanting an honest dick rate. Yeah. Yeah. I um, will generally not give below a six. No? No. You won't go there? No. Unless gotta they, break it to them. Unless you say that like they, they ask for like that. But let them know it's just personal preference. Like... Well, I think maybe it's because I don't actually care that much about the size of a penis. Yeah. Like when it yeah. comes to my partner, it's like not that important to me. So a cock literally would just like not even fall under a six for you. If you want to hear about my, yeah, what goes, what matters to me with dick ratings, um, because I'm actually a photographer, mm-hmm. 
I, the photo matters a lot Mm -hmm. to me. And that's like one of the main things I will focus on. Like a dick is a dick is a dick. Mm -hmm. But um, what I really take into account is the lighting, Mm -hmm. where you're taking the photo. If you're sitting on the toilet and you send me a picture of your dick on the toilet, like instantly you're getting fucking docked. I just don't know how that happens, Because like, I know what you're probably doing at that moment and like do what, you know what I mean? Hard to look past. Come on. The state of the room that you're in. Like I get guys that take a picture of their dick and I look behind the dick and their room's a fucking trash. Mm-hmm. There's like empty pizza boxes, like mm-hmm. it's watered up tissues. Their bed isn't made. There's stains on the sheets. I'm like, what the fuck? Because like as a woman, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of women think that like, I'm not even coming into your bedroom to look at your penis mm-hmm. if it looks like that. Like clean your fucking room because exactly. if like your room is that disgusting, then like what's your hygiene like? Mm-hmm. And also like just I don't want to be in that environment. Like set the mood, you mm-hmm. know? Like give me a clean room. I deserve that much. Okay. You I'm know? Lo- I'm loving this. Like I feel like you should launch like a course for guys because they love taking pictures of their dick. I know. So you could really help the world. So like, many of them honestly, are bad at it. You could make a difference in sex work because we have to see these pictures. So you could <laughs> put, drop the course. I'm here to like, How to promote take that. a good dick pic Please. by Holly Randall. Yes. And yes. then you get higher scores with everybody you request dick rates from. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? You may be onto something. Yeah. I'm here to save sex work Please. from bad dick pics. Because it's a big part of it. <laughs> it is. Yeah. The lighting. But yeah, all of these things I like take into account. And then sometimes like this one guy sent me one and behind I saw like all these records and they were like really cool like albums mm-hmm. and, and bands. And I was like, you You've got great taste in music. That gives you another point. See, the like, brownie points are, are different for you and I, but now I'm, I must tell you, you're you're enlightening me to like be harder on these guys about their pictures. I, I think it's so important. So now I'm going to take this into account. Yeah. In you got really, You got to think about all yeah. of that, like whether or not they're shaved. Um, mm-hmm. What's another thing that I take into account? Um, actually, and also like their personality just mm-hmm. in general, like how they've been, especially if they're patient with me, because mm-hmm. sometimes I get really busy and it yeah, takes me a while see? to do it. But see, when guys request dick rates, they literally want it like that that day. Yeah, and, and it's it ha- like, come for on. For me, it's not happening. No, it's me not neither. possible for it's me. Not possible. Like I have to like set aside yes. time for it. Um, so bonus but, points if they're patient. Yeah. So if they're patient, yeah. I'm like, that literally is a bonus point. Yeah, you're I'm like, like you're automatically obviously nice. a cool guy. Yeah. Because, you know, you were really nice about waiting. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, for me, it's like, I'm like, a penis is a penis. But like, for yeah. me, it's what's around the pe- the person attached to the penis, right? Yeah. Like, that's more important to me. So all of that stuff factors in. Um, it's funny, actually, because this one guy sent me a dick pic. He wanted a dick rating. And he had like, you know, a big... It wasn't even that big. It was fine. Yeah. But I gave him some points off because he, you know, took it in a, a messy room. Mm-hmm. He lost his shit on no me. No way. Lost his shit. He called me, like, he called me all these names. He said I was a dumb whore. Really? Like, you stupid bitch. Like, I have a great huge cock. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? The photo. Like, he went insane. Oh, I'm like, damn. oh, you just lost more points. Like, docking all the Two. points. Like, like, wow. I don't even know if you get a score. Now you get a zero. <laughs> and you get blocked yeah, from my account. Like, for congratulations. Sure. I don't put up with, like, hmm. yeah. no, I don't I don't have a high patience tolerance for any of that. So, yeah, good. It was pretty Good was pretty riddance. Crazy. Yeah. But most of the time, I think that when they, like, join your OnlyFans and they're mm-hmm. paying for your time, they're generally pretty... Um, respectful. Yeah, no, it's I, the free social media platforms where you exactly. make it the opposite. Yeah, I, I agree with you there for sure. Do you get a lot of like trolling comments on your social media? Actually, like I don't know. Um, for some reason, I just have like I'm just I call it like lucky girl syndrome because throughout dancing, I only have one experience. Well, other than like the girls, mm-hmm. but like one ex- customer experience that would have put me off of the industry of dancing Mm. and same with stepping into this industry. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I just love it. Like, uh, I don't have many terrible, terrible experiences. Like, yes, there's a couple stalking incidences that are like serious stuff. But other than that, like, I feel like I, I get in, unless I'm posted on like something mainstream, like world star 
whatever that page is or something. Back in the day, I got posted before I had a thick skin for stuff like that. Oh, like the Daily Star? Yeah. I don't know. One of those like world, kind of tabloidish, star. tabloidish like yeah. online magazines. So they yeah. just threw one of my thoughty videos up and like thousands and thousands and thousands of hate comments, just like disgusting, da 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 da, like all plastic, da da da. Anyways, ripped me apart. I had to like completely shut down my phones. I I actually DMCA'd it to get it, the post taken off. Mm -hmm. But if I had had thicker skin back then, Overnight, my OnlyFans blew up. Overnight, my Instagram blew up. So yeah. I didn't understand that with all that hate would come so much success. Yeah. I didn't put two and two together, so. Well, because the thing is, is that it sounds like that is a platform that doesn't necessarily cater towards sex work specifically. Exactly. Right? And when they do posting about sex work, it's generally like a negative mm -hmm. thing to get that traffic and that attention. And the people that complain and write the negative comments are not the people. Mm -hmm. It's actually a small majority. Mm -hmm. Like if you actually look at, you know, how many followers you have versus like how many comments you get, like most people don't mm -hmm. write comments or say anything. Yeah. Silent and it's watchers. the quiet ones that are the ones that are like going mm -hmm. to, you Pay. know, your pages and mm -hmm. paying. So it's, you know, it's like that yeah. small percentage of like the loud, yeah. angry people, but they're actually not a good representation yes. of your fan base. That was a good learning curve for me, though, because if I could go back into time, like, I would just have let that post ride out and, like, give me all the hate yeah. so I'm making money. Yeah. I could handle it now, but back then I really and couldn't. Just dry your tears with dollar yes, bills. Yes, exactly. It's so oh. Poor me. Oh, poor me. All this hundred is just so yeah. wet. <laughs> so now in 2002, you went through a terrifying experience that left you temporarily blind in both eyes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to talk about. It was terrifying. Yeah, that's got to be. Yeah. So, and the thing is, is I wasn't open and honest with my fans about that cosmetic surgery. So I changed the color of my eyes mm -hmm. to green. Mm -hmm. My mom has green eyes mm -hmm. and I was obsessed with her fucking green eyes. I can't blame my mom for this, but she did give me green eyes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, mom. <laughs> So yeah, I was so obsessed. I'd wear contacts, literally. I'd wake up, put contacts in before I left the house. And I just was like, everyone will think I have green eyes. Like this mm -hmm. was happening back in high school even. Like I wanted green eyes badly. As a dancer, I wore contacts. But before I got into online sex work, I did the cosmetic procedure. I changed my eye color. Mm -hmm. So I rocked it like those were my real eyes. Mm -hmm. Right? So... The surgery went well, and I like I'm really diligent with surgeries, like follow up, aftercare. It's serious business. You are going under the knife. You're doing something like that. I understood the repercussions. I researched it for five years before I did it. The surgery. I didn't know that you could do a surgery that changed yes, the color of your eyes. You're not really. It's not FDA cleared. But what I'm saying is, I did research it the way is like I had a contact on Instagram, and she had it done two years before me, and three years before that, I was looking into the procedure. I was following all these people with the same procedure. They had no complications. I get mine done, okay? I go back to Canada because I had it done in Mexico. And um, everything's fine. Like, I go to the eye doctor. They're not happy with me. They're like, this is scary shit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, but we're not taking them out because you have 20-20 vision. Endothelial cells, they're totally fine. Everything's intact. No damage. We're good. We're going to mm -hmm. watch you every three months. I was in the eye doctors every three months doing my follow-up. Six years go by, no complications. But two years before that, so four years into my procedure, the girl that I talked to had started having problems. The guy that I followed three years before that, he went blind. So I was panicking. So like even two years before my ordeal happened, I was begging Canadian eye doctors Please take these out of my eyes. Please. So were they implants then? Yes. Okay. It was like a silicone um, iris implant. Okay. And they do do the procedure medically for people born without iris color. So, mm -hmm. but. Okay. That doesn't make it better. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, uh, I start getting scared. I start asking for them removed. Canadian doctors won't touch your eyes unless something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So they say, they tell me you'll have to go back to Mexico to get them out. They said, but we don't advise that because if you do that, 
you're risking your sight. Yeah. So I'm scared to do, scared to not. I'm, yeah. I'm, it was a ticking time bomb in my eye. Yeah. I had so many panic attacks within those two years. Just one day, one day I wake up, I can't see out of my right eye, blind. I can't see. I'm just like, this is it. Like I knew it was coming too. Mm -hmm. So that's like the worst part about it. Mm -hmm. So my family pulls together um, like it was only my right eye. Mm -hmm. See the doctor. The doctor's just like, this is a medical anomaly. Like we don't know how that's, this happened because usually eye conditions happen over like a small period of time. Yeah. They do all these tests to be able to see things in advance. Those things literally took my sight in like 24 hours. So yeah, so the right eye started to go. So he rushed me into surgery, got the right eye out. Mm -hmm. Then uh, five days later, same thing happens. Left eye goes, have to get it out. The surgery, because they did some stuff before the surgery to try to prevent things, but it ended up causing more complications. Like they dilated my pupil. So when they go in to take out the implant, it's more risky. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I ended up with 70% vision loss in my right eye, but it wasn't a dark blindness. It's cornea problem. So the implant ended up causing inflammation. It killed off all the endothelial cells mm -hmm. and those don't regenerate. So that's what cornea blindness is. It's like a fog. Like I'd explain it like you're in a steam room and you look out, it's just all just, you could see outlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 70% lost in my right eye and basically... 35 at my left. And um, thank God for Canada medical system. It really like went quickly because my case, like I'm a young person and um, my eye doctor presented my case at like a convention for all of eye doctors of Canada. Mm -hmm. And the leading cornea specialist, he contacted them right away and was like, I want to save her vision and then contacted me. And I was in there for a cornea transplant two weeks later. But wow. I had spent a year and a half with vision loss. Oh my God. Yeah. Once the eye doctor reached out to me, he got me the transplants, what I needed. It's a cellular um, DMAC cornea transplant in both eyes. And he did that so quickly, but yeah, I spent like a year and a half. Wow, so how did you, like how did that affect your life? Mm. I mean, could you drive? Mm. No. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and did you, were you still like camming and, and doing like your, like, did you take a break from work? Oh my God, that's terrifying. Yeah. What was your mindset at that time? I mean, a year and a half is a long time to, to think about and to be, and to fear lifetime of blindness. Mm-hmm. So what did you do? I tried to stay focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell even my good fans. I feel so bad. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't tell them what was going on. Were you able to like kind of fake that you could see okay? Uh, yeah. But I wasn't filming. I was just pushing out old stuff. Mm -hmm. So... Then you went and you got your vision restored. Yes. What was that moment like? That must have been incredible. Oh, gosh. It was, well, because with eyes, you can only operate on one eye at a time. Okay. So it was like a movie experience. All I can explain it is like with this DMAC cornea transplant, it's so amazing how far medical has come. They take the cellular level of somebody's donor tissue, slip it in, like, replacing my endothelial cells that shouldn't have been rejuvenated and put an air pocket in there so that it pushes up against the eye because the cornea is round. Mm -hmm. I lay flat for 24 hours with a bandage over my face. I take it off and like, Holly, I'm just like the moment of you picture in a movie, you open up and it's crystal clear. Wow. Yeah. So this eye got repaired first, my yeah. right eye and then my left eye, but getting that hope so then when I had my left eye done, I was just like, yes, like, and it went just as well. Wow. Lucky girl syndrome. So I was just like, new lease on life. Yeah. Yeah. That You know, those those moments of like fear and those awful experiences often have that 
that silver lining of it makes us appreciate like what we have and like that gratitude. And I think that that's something that's like so important. Mm -hmm. So do you look at your brown eyes now and think like, they're beautiful. (laughs) I love them. Mm -hmm. Uh, That that's like, I don't know. I just like, I haven't even gone there yet, actually. But how long ago did you get your vision back? Because you lost it in 2022. So this is recent. Yeah. So, and time flies, right? And like, well, through the dark points, Mm -hmm. like I had ECT Mm -hmm. because my depression got so bad. So like my memory is not too good. Yeah. Like with stuff and especially with time. But um, I've been 2020 vision and in the clear with stable vision for a year and three months. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Do you still wake up every morning? And, uh, like can't, like can't believe no, it? No, like, I'm not there it. yet. Like the mornings are the worst part for me because mm. like there's so much trauma that it's still like, I am scared to death every day to open my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, and then I trust, like I have to put in drops now for the rest of my life. But <clears throat> so it's like a whole routine. So the morning's like waking up, I go through like a roller coaster, terrified. Yeah. Okay, confirm I can see still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the drops and get on with life and be super grateful. Yeah. But yeah, terrified to open yeah. my eyes. I mean, in the, morning. The, the eyes are like, that's such a, they're so delicate. In moments like that, you realize like how incredibly delicate they are. So I yeah. had a not even remotely similar experience, but. So when my father died a year and a half ago, I cried so much that it gave myself a severe infection in both of my eyes. <laughs> and like this one eye, people are going to be so grossed out, but like it swelled out and I got this like lumpy tissue. Like So it's, yeah, like it almost was, like a sty, but but it was like it looked like tissue? a gummy it looked like a, a melted gummy bear Yikes. like on my eyeball. It was gnarly. Yeah. And I was like I'm going to lose my eye. Mm. Like it was Scary. so terrifying. Yeah. And then after that, I got extreme dry eye where every morning, like my eyes were like that's crusted how, that's shut. Exactly what I, that's a complication. So the, the dry eye thing. Yeah. Yeah. It said, and so I went to the doctor and he said that the infection was so bad that I permanently damaged my tear ducts and I had to get a stint put on Permanent, my eye. Yes. I have the same thing. Yeah. So there's like a, for a dry eye treatment, there are like little silicone things in the yeah. tear ducts. Yeah. Yeah. Sisters, yes, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so weird. It, like, I yeah. remember he just and you know, there's no anesthesia no, or anything like that. They just take a little, a nub, a little, um, yeah. uh, tweezers and just yeah. grab this little tiny piece of plastic and just like stick it in your eye. And yeah. I just remember being like, dude, don't fuck up. It's still in there, right? Uh, so mine actually, so he told me that I was gonna have to have it in there for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's been over six months. And it's like definitely dissolved, and I'm mm. actually like okay. Mm. Like I, I don't need it anymore. No dry no more. No, that's good. Which is weird. That's good. Mm-hmm. So I'm like okay, nice. But yeah, that was that was really scary. Yeah. Oh my god. So I yeah. Can, like I said, not even remotely the same situation, good. but definitely a moment of panic of thinking like, oh my god, I'm gonna like lose my eyes. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't make you realize like how lucky we are to be oh, able to see. Well, now I see like, yeah, I'll like get super triggered when I see social media posts like of eye complications, eye stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, I know what you're going through. I just want to reach through there and hug you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that um, your doctor was like a specialist in this, and um, what have their your conversations with been with him since the surgery? Yeah, so crazy story, but like people against sex work. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, the cornea transplant went so well and he did such a good job. I wanted to participate in like studies Mm -hmm. and also like give hope to other people that Mm -hmm. this works or whatever. So emailing back and forth. And I wanted to get involved that way, like donation-wise, help help out. Anyways, with my email, they must have found out that I do sex work. And they said I can't participate and that they don't want to deal with someone like me. <laughs> yeah, so that was, like, hard to hear. He never made me feel that way. Yeah. But, like, oh, they're uncomfortable with your email. I don't know if I can c- 
confirm that this is what's happened, but maybe I'm a little sensitive because other experiences like that in my life. Mm -hmm. But what about my email makes you uncomfortable? They must have looked you up. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, this happens all the time. So that's what I, I know because I went yeah. to buy a house and the realtor denied me. I went to do yeah. banking. This, you know, it's, it happens. I've had insurance denied so to me. I've had credit. I don't We've like We've all to, like experienced that. It's I'm not going to confirm and say that was the situation, but I wasn't too happy about that because I would have loved to help out in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so crazy how people can't separate like what you do for a living mm -hmm. from this you know, incredibly successful medical procedure where you could go out and you could educate people mm -hmm. on the topic and you could help, you know, people save their eyes and yeah. all this incredible good that you could do. And it's just such a shame that people still see those in sex work that way. Yeah. But I don't want to like fully say that that's what happened, but in my head, I feel a little bit that way. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the rest of us who work in way. sex work can confirm that your guess is probably yeah. correct. But my eye doctor that I, like, I have a couple eye doctors, so when mm -hmm. I talk about eye doctors, but my eye doctor that I deal with now, like, beautiful soul that she is, she invited me to participate with, like, um, the uh, cataract fund. Mm -hmm. So I did that this year. I did, like, participated in the gala this year. That was fun. Oh, that's it's great. Funny. They did that. Um, but, yeah, all in all, I'm try I've, I've contacted a girl, a lady, that she does, like, really amazing work exposing like the underbellies of things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to get the word out there because now they're doing this new procedure where they're dyeing the eye. Mm. So it's like a tattoo of your eyeball to change the eye color. And I'm just like, if I could warn everybody around, don't fuck with your eyes. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not worth it. Yeah. Don't let vanity do that. No. Definitely not. Well, yeah. thank you for the message. Yeah. I feel like someone's going to see this and they're going to yeah. It's going to make them change their mind. But I'm wanting to try and participate to actually pursue and shutting bright ocular down. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's out of Mexico, right? No, they do it out of India, um, Mexico, uh, Turkey. So the surgeon that did my eyes, he, he um, after he found out I lost my vision and I emailed him, he blocked me first, but then he stopped doing the procedure. Oh, okay. Because he's worried about repercussions. Yeah. He was right beside like the Texas border. And if that gets out for him, for his. Yeah. But then my eye, eye doctor found out that he operated on me without even having the rights to operate. Wow. Yeah. It's great. Hey, like he's a like actual eye doctor, but he did it shady. He wasn't supposed to have rights at the hospital. He ended up getting in there somehow because the, yeah, I don't want to say too much about my doctor because I don't want to say who it was or anything, but yeah. he was able to find out the information that that, do that eye doctor actually should have never been able to operate on me. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's scary, man. Yeah. In the end, they're just people. Yeah. Right. And they aren't not always the best people, Yeah, but we trust <laughs> them with like so much of us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Karina, thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on and sharing okay. your story. I know it was hard and, but I think that it's gonna. It's it was gonna mostly help some, fun. It got hard for a sec. It's gonna help somebody out there. Yeah. Um. I do have some questions for you for my Patreon members, which Cute. I'm gonna ask in a separate little Q and A segment for Patreon members only. If that's okay. Yeah. Let's go private. All right. So <laughs> ooh, I like that. I like. I've never put it that way. Um. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Yes. I'm Karina Kova. If you enjoyed this interview, enjoyed seeing me, come get to know me. Especially on my OnlyFans, I get really personal there. And it's just pretty simple. Karina Kova. Um, my Instagram's a little bit harder to find. Uh, it's not searchable, but if you do some digging or Google it first, Karina Kova underscore productions, it's at 1.8 mil. So find me there. Uh, I do have one backup account, but all others are fake. And then on Twitter, or sorry, X, it's just Karina Kova. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Plug. Yeah, it's a good way to get around the yeah. shadow ban, which a lot of people in sex work Google are. Google search. Google search Instagram plus their name, and then you'll find them. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of wild. And you guys can, of course, find me on Instagram and on X at Holly Randall. And um, go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my platforms. And of course, patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to support this show, watch these um, live streams. 
and also uh, get access to the Q&As like the one we're about to do. So thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.